help you don't get the sickness. My boy Kurt is a stay-at-home dad. Watching Disney movies he never had. His daughter digs through all the VHS. Crushing the classics in a princess dress. Informed like Scuttle, Kurt's got your ticket. Making it real like Jiminy Cricket. Most are off the Captain Hook, but if the Tweedle dumb, he'll be taking more shots than Bambi's mom. Leave some rays like Simba, or crack like the Beast dishes. He'll show you a whole new world. You won't need free wish. Stay at home, Disney Dad. This is bananas. B A N A N A S. We start with the trailer. For the re release of The Little Mermaid, oh wait, it's coming back to theaters this year? That's fun. The way they, they tee it up in this trailer makes it seem like The Little Mermaid is the most important Disney movie ever before the cub became a king, before the genie was freed, before Belle met a beast. There was a mermaid who dreamt of being human. Oh, actual goosebumps, right? Like part of your world, easily top five best Disney song of all time. Add for Herbie, Herbie the Love Bug Collection. And here we go, feature presentation. Moonrise Night School. We start out with a song. I have zero expectations, which is kind of electrifying. I can't tell if this is a generic song or if this is a song like explaining the plot. Some guy gets on a motorbike and just rides as the song and the opening credits flow. He cuts off a car that honks at him. He looks back and smirks and he pulls up beside another motorcycle cop and he's kind of mocking the cop. This guy's being a dick, but I think this is back in a time when being a dick to everyone was like an attractive trait for your male protagonist. I don't know. I'll look all this up later. He looks familiar. Uh, he pulls an up next to a car and in the back seat we meet Raffles the monkey. The credits tell us this is Raffles. The song repeats he's gonna have a quote barefoot friend and that kind of sounds like he's gonna knock someone up doesn't it? Right? Barefoot? Okay. He heads to the UBC television studios and the great Gustav starts at 8 p.m. that night. That There's a nerd hitting on a blonde and besmirching the guy on the motorbike. That's Steve and he doesn't like Steve because he's in night school or something. All right. They're screening a new show and there's all these critics there and they don't like it. The show went out live on the network for the first time but it was like a viewing party and in the studio everyone is pretty meh about this show. And uh, the owner, or like the TV exec, knows he's in trouble. The nerd hitting on the blonde is Roger, and his uncle is the TV exec named Francis Willibanks. And now the boss's boss from New York calls Francis, and the sponsors are all there, and they thought it was fine. Everybody thought this show was fine. And they remind Francis the ratings are going to be out tomorrow, and that's going to tell the real story. Everyone is scared to tell Francis that they really think the show is meh. So Steve slips a note into Francis's pocket before trying to talk to him, and Francis bites his head off. Francis gets home and yells at the paper boy, and then drives backwards over the paper boy's new bike, and the paper boy starts crying. So Francis tosses the papers and the kid into his car, and they go for like a long drive, tossing papers out the limo windows onto the lawn. So Francis is helping this kid finish his route. I thought Francis was going to be the rich, snooty antagonist of this movie. I don't know. Steve and the blonde named Jen work at the network. Steve is the only one brave enough to tell Francis that he thought his show sucked. Steve wants to do a show called Abraham Lincoln's Doctor's Dog. Francis tells him off, then does a 180 and is like, tell me about the show. And Steve says, well, Abe is ratings, doctors are ratings, and dogs are ratings. So combine them, and I hate how easy it is and how that much makes sense. And suddenly I'm looking at every show I've ever liked through that lens and it's pretty depressing. So oh, Steve works in the mail room at the TV station and Jen is like the office manager. The network exec from New York tells Francis he's coming to town and wants, wants him to pick him up from the airport next Tuesday. Francis finally checks out the ratings the next day and screams because the ratings, his ratings, are terrible. Bottom of the bin. Francis asks Jen how she can stand Steve and we get an extreme close up of Jen's smiling face and she goes, Guess I'm just hooked. She does not look familiar, but her voice sounds familiar. Okay, wait, Steve and Jen live together? I thought they were like in high school. Now, something happened and they have a monkey. Someone in Jen's family left her a chimpanzee just like that. And yes, I'll probably call it a monkey or an ape or a chimpanzee for the rest of the review. And no, I don't know the difference. So whatever, shut up. Someone had it in the family and they couldn't keep it. And they were going to give it to the zoo. But then Jen said, no, don't give it to the zoo. Give it to me. So she took it home. So Steve calls the monkey a miserable, spoiled chimp. 
You want a face full of feces, Steven? That's how you get a face full of thrown feces. Okay, Jen scolds Steve and tells him to watch TV with the damn monkey and relax. So the monkey's watching TV and he starts freaking out. Steve turns the channel manually. He gets up and turns the channel because it's 1971 to football. Monkey gets up and turns it back to the last show they were watching. This continues. The monkey freaks out when Steve changes it again and Jen is like, don't change the channel. It makes him upset. Jen is the voice of Daphne from Scooby-Doo, isn't it? Jen is 100% Daphne. Steve looks 12 years old and Jen asks him to pour the wine. This is weird. The monkey doesn't want to watch Star Journey and Steve has met his match with his channel changing monkey. Okay, Roger is Francis's nerdy nephew as I mentioned. The lovebirds brought the monkey to work and he's sitting on Jen's desk and some kids come and gawk at him. The monkey keeps turning all the TVs at the station to the shows he wants to see. Steve is like, monkey knows what good TV is. This shit is bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. So Steve starts testing the monkey and making the monkey watch a bunch of different shows and seeing what the monkey likes and what the monkey doesn't like. Jen has fallen asleep on the couch while Steve and Monkey continue their TV bromance. Steve has a black toque on like he's gonna go rob a bank, but he's still taking notes with a pencil on a pad and paper. That's wonderful, that takes me back. The next morning, Steve is telling Francis that the monkey picked all the top rated shows. He knows, he knows. Uh, he rides his motorbike in and out of honking traffic again, screaming, he knows! The cop pulls him over because he's a madman biking around yelling, he knows, he knows, I'm gonna be rich! I still can't tell if Steve is the protagonist or the antagonist in this show. He arrives back at Jen's place or their place with flowers for Jen and bananas for the chimp. Raffles is gone. Roger took him for a walk. Steve blows a gasket. Bad creep! Jen is frantic. Roger's not a creep! And this is not a healthy relationship. Steve, Steve, Steve seems very abusive. Roger's walked like 10 feet outside the apartment and on already, has already noticed that the chimp likes TV because there's a TV playing in a storeroom window. Steve is losing his as he sees his payday slipping away. Suddenly the monkey goes mad and throws a rock through the store window and busts the display TV. So Roger is going to jail and Steve and Jen are going to bail him out. And everyone is angry, but for some reason they can't bail him out. They can only bail the monkey out. So they bail the chimp out and they leave Roger in prison for the night. Steve loads Jen and the chimp onto his motorbike and they speed off as Roger sits alone in the jail cell, awaiting whatever horrors will come to him in the next 12 hours. Good stuff, good stuff. Jen now wants to give away the chimp, but Steve doesn't. Next, Roger's finally out of jail. He's got a teardrop tattoo and emotional baggage and he and Jen are at a ball game. See, Steve sent his girlfriend and his rival, who wants to bang his girlfriend on a date together, just so he can spend the time, more time, with the TV-loving chimp. Steve dressed like a robber, and he sneaks out of the house, leaving the chimp inside in his jammies. Someone's lost their linear storytelling ability. It was me or the movie. I must have missed something as I was writing. As the station, Steve is telling his boss that he has a fail-safe way to predict ratings, but Francis won't have it. Jen wants Steve to come over tonight, and he says no, because he'd rather watch TV with a chimp then have a go at Daphne from Scooby-Doo. That night, Steve is pumping the chimp for ratings info and types a letter to the big boss, that Crampton guy who's flying to town the next day. The note is explaining how he can predict hit shows. Steve tries to give his letter to the limo driver to give to this Crampton guy, and the limo driver doesn't want to, but watch out for Steve, because he's the master of reverse psychology. He plays mind tricks on the man, and the chauffeur gets upset and agrees to pass the note to Crampton. Crampton gets the note and he's impressed and he calls a meeting with Steve, but Francis is freaking out and wants to shut it down, but Crampton tells him to be in the viewing room at 6 p.m. and they're going to see how good this boy Steve really is at picking the hit shows. Uh, spy music begins and he sneaks the chimpanzee into the viewing room in a plumber's outfit. Okay, that was cute. Saxophone and tambourine solo transition as Steve gets Mr. Peepers or whatever his name is set up to screen the show at 6 p.m. To avoid suspicion though, Steve pulls the animal up in the mail elevator. Like he sends him up there. Multiple shots of the chimpanzee in a moving mail elevator and they probably killed like eight champ chimpanzees trying to shoot this one scene. Okay, he's, oh, he swapped chimps. That's what the scene was back there when I was typing. He got a second chimp and he swapped them, leaving a new chimp at Jen's place and taking the real chimp with him back to work. Okay, this sh is bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. The chimp is on his way up the mail chute and Jen finds Steve and she's talking his ear off and he's trying to get rid of her and she's just oblivious until her ride is about to leave. And she's like, Jen, we gotta go. And she has to go. So he's not busted in the end as this monkey comes up the mail chute. In the screening room, he smuggles in the chimp. Francis and Crampton are showing a new show that they're sure is gonna be the hit, but the monkey is making raspberries, which in chimpanzee means this new television program has failed to impress me. Chimps are cute when they put their long arms around your neck. Love it. The monkey is being too loud in the room, so Steve quickly bails and he puts the monkey in the projector booth with his buddy. They show a new show. Francis and Crampton hate this one, but the chimp loves it. Steve tries to tell him that no, 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 this is the hit, and they toss Steve out. 
Why ask Steve's opinion if they weren't going to listen to it and already knew what they were going to do and which show to go with? You know what? Never mind. No, no. That's, a, that's an actual true depiction of managers and management. Crampton tells Francis to fire Steve. Well, that didn't work out. Now he's at home getting the gears from Jen. This is such... Like that style of acting that, gee, Jen, why won't they listen? Gosh, why won't they just listen to me? Steve's answer to being rejected. He goes back to the studio and swaps reels so the show the chimp likes plays instead of the one the executives like. Okay, here we go. The wrong show plays, it's Devil Dan. The one the monkey liked. Francis says, I'm going to fire every boob in the production truck. There's no production truck. Steve stands up and takes credit for switching the reels. He's proud, and then he gets fired. Steve leaves, and Roger tries moving in on Jen again. Jen wants to come with Steve to get a hamburger, and he says no, and he bikes away. This guy. Then he comes back, and he's like, you really want a hamburger? And he picks her up. Okay. Next day, newspaper headline, Devil Dan Tops Shows. It killed in the ratings. All right. Time for Steve to come swaggering back to work, wearing a pair of those, like, chap so everyone can kiss it. Honestly, I'd watch the hell out of Devil Dan. That show looks great. Am I a chimpanzee? No. So it's not just me. Everyone loved Devil Dan. I want a Devil Dan t-shirt. I mean, look at this. Francis walks in and he's a hero. The big boss from New York calls and tells him to lock Steve into a contract. But, 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 but you told me to fire him last night. Nope. He plays the reverse Uno card and Stephen Post is the new program director of the station. But, but it's not Steve. It's the monkey. Steve needs the monkey to, oh, what a delicate web we weave. This sh is bananas. Steve has a giant office now and Jen is all over him and just think you did it all on your own. Yikes, Daphne doesn't realize she's giving him the gears while he's refusing to give her the gears. Doesn't Steve realize whenever someone gets in like an autistic savant chimpanzee to speculate hit shows for a major television network, it rarely works out. Rarely. Montage of Steve watching new shows and secretly checking the monkey and Jen pouring wine down Steven's throat. She wants to split up and look for clues in his pants. Honestly, Daphne is giving off heat for this guy in every single scene. Steve is up for an award, but he's cracking. The telltale heart is beating under his floorboard, but instead of a beating heart, Steve has a monkey dressed like a train conductor. At the award ceremony, it's the most coveted award, TV's Man of the Year. Sounds sexist to me, but Steven wins by a landslide. He gets a free swank car, and he's going to drive it home and finally make love to Jen. Right here. This would be a great time for the plot twist of all plot twists. And Raffles, the chimpanzee, drops the stupid monkey act, shows up with a cigar, pulls Steven to the shadows, and is like, all right, bro, time to tag me back in, or I'm going to tell everyone your secret. And then a sad Steve tosses the car keys to the monkey, and Ruffles drives away with Jen. That's the movie I want to see. Suddenly, Francis and Roger are worried they created a monster in Steve by giving him too much too fast. And Francis tell Ra tells Rod to go spy on him and figure out his process. So he breaks into Steve's place and watches Steve get the chimpanzee all set up to watch the new shows and rate them. Or I mean, he doesn't actually see the chimpanzee. Another great twist would be if the chimp was uh, just all in Steve's head, like Ruffles never actually existed. If this was a horror movie between 2004 and 2009, that's exactly how it would go down. So Rod hides in a closet, and he's trying to see who else is there. And there's an uncomfortably long shot of his eyes peeking out behind some jackets and hangers. They hold this for like 30 seconds. The chimp finally hears him and busts Rod and Jig is up and Rod runs scared out of the suite and tattles to his uncle. And they're trying to make sense of the three chairs and the mountain of bananas he saw in Steve's place because he never actually saw Ruffles. Jen is there as well taking notes and she seems to be fine with Rod breaking and entering and spying on her boyfriend. I don't know. Rod says Steve has a phantom roommate and like her pal Thelma, Jen collects the clues, and Jinkies gets to the bottom of this mystery. She storms home and yells at Steve, and he flexes his abusive relationship muscles, all like, I did it for you, Jen! I knew you'd never want to marry a male boy with a motorcycle. And she says, hey, there's nothing wrong with a motorcycle. Savage, Jen. Also, I was hoping she pulled Steve's mask off, and it was the man that runs the gas station down the block, and he would have got away with it, too, if it wasn't for Jen and that stupid monkey. <sighs> Ruffy, Ruffy, Ruffles! Roger sets up a telescope and they peep into Steve's window. This is happening. He's watching TV and there is Mr. Peepers also watching TV. They say there's no possible way the chip knows anything about TV, but then it goes and gets a beer during a commercial break, which is kind of funny because Francis and all the execs watching are like, that's proof positive! That that's really funny. Well done. They try to kidnap the chimp, but they bumble at Francis and his like limo driver. They get stuck on the side of the building like 30 stories up because they do the thing where they try to go out one window and into another window into a different apartment and they to steal the chimp. But then the police show up and they say, quote, it's a couple of nuts trying to commit suicide. Not the 
best reaction to that situation that aged poorly they interrupt the regular programming on francis's own station and they go live with the situation the network owner from new york says all oh, the nuts are out tonight then oh no it's francis on the side of the building francis falls and the fire department catch him in one of those giant circular nets and they take him away to the funny farm the police grab the limo driver next and tries to explain to the police that they were trying to steal the chimp because it could pick the best tv shows thinking no one's going to believe that crazy story but they do for some reason the newspaper runs with the story there's a reporter interviewing people in the streets and he gets perfect audio despite never having proper interview mic placement ever there's a meeting and the network execs want to send the chimp back to the jungle so the secret doesn't come out. The network wants to buy him. And Steve tells Jen, he can't be bought. Jump cut to them giving Steve a million dollars. Jump cut back to Jen who is pissed at Steve because he took the money and she doesn't want to marry him anymore. And she breaks up with him. I still can't tell if Steve is the protagonist or the antagonist of this movie. They're loading chimp. They're loading the chimp onto a plane to... Uh, and droopy dog Steve watches and says, sure would do it different if I had another chance. A bunch of news crews are on the plane getting shots of the monkey being tossed out of the plane back into the Amazon jungle or whatever. But then when they try to chuck the monkey out of the plane over the jungle, of course, the bumbler's got a bumble and they all end up being outsmarted by this chimp and they all fall out of the plane and the plane lands and it's just the driver and the chimp and he's like, sorry, I failed. The chimp pops out, gets back in the car with Roger and Francis. Steven quits his job. He gave Francis his million dollars back in exchange for the chimp and Jen is back and they drive away on his motorbike with just him and Jen and there's a just married flag waving behind the bike and we get the song's intro which is now the extra song and that's all she wrote for this one. Okay, Steve was, oh my god, Steve was Kurt Russell, I see it now. Francis, the actor, was Joe Flynn, who was, like, owned by Disney and did a whole bunch of voiceovers and voice acting, including the voice of Mr. Snopes in The Rescuers. No, thanks. Jen was Peter's sister, Heather North, who, yes, was the iconic voice of Daffy from Scooby-Doo. Oh, that's good. I got a lot of miles out of that during the review. I was praying I wasn't wrong. John Ritter was Roger. Didn't look familiar at all. And Ruffles, our beloved Ruffles, only did this. That's showbiz. This sh is... What do you think? What we have is a concern about Curtis Anderson. His interviewing style is not the best. His personal appearance is not the best. I was wondering if the man has some kind of a hold over the channel that uh, he's allowed to be employed for so long with the standards of journalism and personal appearance that he